My name is John Thackerer, speaking to you from my home in the small town of Garnes in the south of France. My talk today is about design for urban biodiversity at multiple scales, from microbe to bioregion, which is the title of my talk. Along with the other speakers you've heard today, I will describe a radically new model of urban development, designing for shared aliveness. My talk is not speculative, it's not about things that would be nice. On the contrary, I'll focus on myriad small experiments that are happening all around us in different parts of the world. When you add my stories to the inspiring examples you've heard already in today's conference, I come to a startling conclusion. If you connect these signals of change together, a whole new economy emerges, not just a new city. Business that serves place, or B2P. But I want to start with a question. Why is it such hard work to make the transition to a green and sustainable society? The environmental movement is 50 years old. Millions of people have advocated for change and proposed alternatives. But although we push and push, the top of that hill never seems to arrive. For an answer to that question, I consulted two experts on biodiversity from a previous generation. Here, firstly, is Hippocrates. The Hippocratic Oath sworn by Western doctors today is named after him. 2,000 years ago, he described the effects of airs, waters and places on the health of individuals and communities. He was one of the first in the Western world to remind us that cities and the people who live in them are part of the natural world. They are not apart. In China, at around the same time as Hippocrates, the Tao taught us to judge the affluence of a society by the number of different species that live there. If all things in the universe grow well, then a society is a community of affluence, we were taught. If not, this kingdom is on the decline. This wise advice to governments and the people, take good care of nature. But somehow, as the years went by and we entered the industrial age, the urban and the rural became separated. Isolated from nature physically and also cognitively, we lost touch with our understanding of the world as a single living system. The consequence today, we either don't think about rivers, soils and biodiversity at all, or we treat them as resources whose only purpose is to feed the economy. Paving over the soil and filling our lives with media obscured our interdependency with other forms of life. This disconnection lies behind the grave challenges we face today. But now we are rediscovering that the health of a place and of the persons who inhabit it are one story. Cities and the people who live in them are part of the natural world. Signals of this shift, a reconnecting between the living world and the economic one, have been appearing around the world. In Paris in 2011, a huge exhibition called The Fertile City featured urban ecosystems in which human and nature coexist. The projects presented included rivers restored by volunteers, trees planted by community teams, rainwater harvested by neighbours, gardens tended by school students. Efforts to bring nature back into the city became practical with books like this one, published in 2016. It was a practical to-do list of public spaces in a city that could, in various ways, be rewilded. Parks, roadsides, private gardens, cemeteries, airports, and many more, as you can see in that list. Ten years after the Fertile City exhibition, a book called Multi-Species Cities emerged from Solarpunk. Now, Solarpunk is a literary and artistic movement that envisions a world in which nature and community are in harmony. Books like this are sold as science fiction, but their pages include known and low-tech ways of living sustainably. Urban farming, regenerative design, tool libraries, maker spaces, open source. 
The most fantastic notion in this book is that a city should be home to multiple species, not just humans. But here's a surprise. Although solar punk is packaged as science fiction, the idea of a city habitable for all of life, not just human life, is no longer far-fetched. My own books, for example, are non-fiction. I seek out projects in the real world that are examples of ways to meet our daily life needs using radically fewer energy and resources. But my subject areas and the themes of solar punk also include practices that benefit for all of life, not just human life. Grounding, water keeping, feeding, caring. An ecological approach to the design of cities builds on some surprisingly good news. There can be more biodiversity in cities than in many rural areas that we think about as nature. A, an urban biologist in the Netherlands, for example, identified 300 different species in one square kilometre of her city, compared to just 50 different species in the same area of industrially farmed countryside nearby. Researchers in other cities have confirmed those results. Disuse industrial areas, rail yards, the edges of motorways, brownfield sites of all kind are teeming with diverse forms of life. Many city people are happy with this news. That weed, for example, is growing at the door of a small shop 100 metres from where I live in France. The words say, let me grow. This surprising sentiment is spreading. The English writer Richard Maybe was one of the first to realise that the concepts of urban and rural are losing their meaning for city dwellers. Even the most neglected urban landscape is capable of supporting life. A crack in the pavement is all a plant needs to put down roots, may be recorded. What unites the fiction of solar punk, the real world projects that people like me write about, and that shopkeeper's weed, is the idea of the city as life world. The industrial age has distracted us from this understanding. Paving over the soil and filling our lives with media obscured our interdependency with living systems. A regenerative city in this context is habitable for all of life, not just human life. It means thinking of the city as a local living economy, not as a machine. And it means the embrace of biodiversity as a key measure of a city's health, not just the amount of money that flows through it. But what does this transformation in values mean in practice? Three years ago, in 2019, I was invited by Professor Lu Yonchi, Vice President of Tonji University, to create an event in Shanghai called Urban Rural. It was about the reconnection between cities and nature. Located in this huge dome, Urban Rural brought together 100 projects that were already underway in China and around the world. When connected together, these projects told a new, leave things better story of value and therefore of growth. Growth in this new story means soils, biodiversity and watersheds getting healthier and communities more resilient. Many of the projects in urban rural involved rivers and efforts to bring them back to life in an urban context. The one you see here is the River Furon in Saint Etienne, France. Citizen action featured in many watershed recovery projects that we covered in urban rural. This one is in Japan, but in thousands of projects around the world, citizens and professionals are collaborating. They call it Pro-Am Rewilding. I think you were told earlier in the day about these wonderful habitat gardens in Shanghai. Here and in other cities, paved surfaces are being replaced by fertile soil and ponds for plants and wildlife. The beauty of such interventions is this, as they multiply they can be connected together in urban ecological corridors. This canal side garden in Kyoto is signal of a broader trend, urban agriculture becoming mainstream in modern cities. Food growing is beginning to take the place of concrete and cars to an amazing degree. 
Urban agroforestry often makes use of underutilized lands, including school grounds, playgrounds, roadsides, riversides, vacant building lots, rooftops and existing parks and green spaces. Alongside the physical change involved in an urban food system, new kinds of social infrastructure are also emerging that, as well as connecting urban people and rural communities, also create new jobs and livelihoods. In Amsterdam, for example, this large-scale urban food forest involves collaborative ways to grow food, repair the land and increase biodiversity. These activities are beginning to foster new forms of hospitality and tourism, learning journeys and educational experiences. A pattern is emerging. Cities no longer see urban agriculture as being just about food. Urban farming brings a range of other benefits too. Mitigation of surface runoff, reduction of urban heat island effect, enhancement of biodiversity, alleviation of urban poverty and inequality, improvement of social cohesion and enhancement of community resilience. I don't want to underplay the role of food here. In this UK city, for example, a recent survey discovered that many urban plants turn out to be edible. Herbal fruits, leaves and edible flowers grow on walls and roadsides, between paving stones and in other untended places. In Berlin, in Germany, a fascinating project called Lebensmittelpunkte is reconnecting people with nature through agriculture. In Berlin, access to nature via food growing is combined with the concept of a 15-minute city. The map here shows locations where high-quality food is traded, stored, processed, cooked and eaten together. These meeting points are places of learning and exchange for a wide variety of people. Communal kitchens used for preparing meals are also used for cooking courses and nutrition education for all generations. In addition to welcoming urban agriculture, many cities have ambitious tree planting programs. They've realized that the cooling effect of one young tree is the same as 10 room-sized air conditioners operating 20 hours a day. And yet, most urban trees die at the young age of 10, when, biologically, they should thrive for 50 years or more. This discovery has made cities aware that their expertise and understanding of urban trees is severely limited. The new trend is to combine food growing and tree planting in urban agroforestry. Mixtures of different species of nut or fruit trees, berry shrubs and other crops are designed as multifunctional woody polycultures. These supply food and a broad array of other ecosystem services. Increased diversity within these urban forests mimics natural forests and therefore aids in their health and resilience. A new startup in the urban tree ecosystem is Trees as Infrastructure, or Trees AI. Trees AI provides cities with the impact assessment and investment tools they need to fund, manage and maintain portfolios of nature-based solutions based on trees. This open source initiative addresses the gap between urban tree planting targets, their sustainable delivery, and long-term maintenance of urban forests. There is huge potential to expand urban forests and food growing in cities. As a legacy of the car age, roads and parking facilities typically cover more than 50% of urban land in major cities. In the US alone, 2 billion parking spaces could be depaved. These impervious surfaces prevent rainwater from entering the soil, and instead divert it to nearby waterways. And this water carries pollutants such as oil, antifreeze, plastics, pesticides and heavy metals from the roads into local streams and rivers. So-called guerrilla depavering began as an illicit form of activist action wherein permeable hard surfaces are wholly removed or perforated to reveal the underlying soil bed. In recent times, 
depaving has started to become mainstream. In this art project in Arnhem, in the Netherlands, activist citizens of all ages are freeing the soil in the city centre. In Portland, Oregon, the depaving movement is growing in scale and ambition. Larger and larger teams remove unnecessary pavement from urban areas to create community green spaces and mitigate stormwater runoff. In Chicago, 25 to 30 percent of urban land is covered with asphalt. This pavement pollutes waterways through stormwater runoff and contributes to residual flooding and worsens the urban Eat Highland effect. Depaved Chicago is a community depaving program that replaces underutilized parking lots and paved spaces with gardens, pocket forests, and other nature based designs. Restoring nature on that scale in Chicago may seem implausible now, but the era is a growing consensus that such a transformation can be achieved through an accumulation of local actions. Deep paving operates on a city's surface, but as habitants and as ecosystems, cities are multidimensional. Other living interfaces have potential too. The rhizosphere, where most soil microorganisms are to be found, the phylosphere, which is the total above ground surface of plants, another huge habitat for microorganisms, and of course the hydrosphere, all the waters in a city such as lakes, rivers and seas. Restoration of urban microbial biodiversity in all these dimensions can benefit health in many different ways. Researchers in the Microbes and Social Equity Group, for example, explore how different kinds of microbes that we interact with are influenced by aspects of daily life, as well as the social policies which support or oppress livelihoods. Microbiome-inspired green infrastructure, or MIGI, is a framework for managing urban construction projects so that multidisciplinary teams of researchers and practitioners can explicitly consider environmental microbiota in design and construction contexts, thereby increasing ecosystem functionality and public health. MIGI is complex. It addresses the interaction of microbes, soils, plants, buildings, and of course, human bodies. Scientists are now mapping the microbial populations of cities, buildings, soils, and systems using the quantitative metrics of DNA sequence analysis. Practical applications of MIGI, an evolving movement towards a probiotic architecture, are now emerging. At the Laboratory for Living Interfaces, for example, Elizabeth Enaf and others are developing bioreceptive concrete, a building material deliberately designed to host microbial life, both unicellular and multicellular inhabitants. The next step is to integrate that information into architectural and urban design. When I discussed MIGI with my boss at Tonji University, Professor Lon Chi, he told me, we need a prototype. So I started work on how a MIGI for the Tonji University campus would work. The COVID pandemic regrettably caused this project to be paused, but as soon as the situation improves, it would be a great experiment. We know more about the movement of the celestial bodies than about the soil underfoot. Those words were expressed by Leonardo da Vinci, the Italian artist and designer, 500 years ago. Now, 500 years later, the accumulation of scientific knowledge tells us that a single teaspoon of healthy soil may contain thousands of species, a billion individuals, and 100 meters of fungal networks. So much teeming life just beneath our feet. As I argued at the start of my talk, biological diversity is the most, most important measure of urban quality and livability. Based on that core value, a question arises. In what practical ways can we make cities hospitable for all of life, not just human life? I will give you two examples. A recent design workshop at Milan Polytechnic in Italy 
explored just this question. Practical ways to make cities hospitable for all of life and not just human life. One proposal called Driadi enables bi-directional relationship with nature via sound. With the aim of give nature her voice back, the platform connects people with the internal sound of trees using non-invasive audio sampling. Sensors capture the inner sounds of trees and convert these to a melody. This symphony can be experienced via headphones or speakers by connecting an app to the system. My second example is work by design students at Tonji University. My colleague there, Professor Valsecki, challenged students to redirect their focus from human-centered to all-of-life-centered design. Among our diverse and wonderful variety of scenarios for ecological coexistence, this was a favorite of mine. A digital analog tool that helps you see the world as if you were a fly. I would love to show you more examples of designing for life, but I need to draw things to a close. So here are three takeaways from this talk, which the books also cover. One. Common prosperity, for me, means shared aliveness. Two, caring for life means caring for place, especially our cities. And three, caring for life in the city is the basis of a new economy, business to place. This transformation is not small. We are talking about a new development paradigm. Nature reconnection is at the heart of this approach. Its practical focus is ecological restoration, as I repeat, that helps all of life thrive, not just human life. And a key concept, one health, the health of humans and ecosystems as a single story. To summarize my summary, I leave you with these words from the German philosopher Andreas Weber. If we design well, we design for shared aliveness.